Hello everyone. Welcome to Qtrix International, which is brought to you by Ilma University in collaboration with Rotary International District 3271, powered by Numan Group of Companies. Hi everyone. Did you ever imagine about having universities without walls? I also never thought of it. But these changing times have made us to start working on universities without walls. Ladies and gentlemen, today we'll have a dialogue session with one of the most renowned academic celebrities of the world, who is president of the University of Europe for Applied Sciences, Germany, and chief executive for academic affairs at Global Universities System. He has a thorough expertise on building universities without walls. and the future outlook for educational institutions in 2030 before starting our conversation with him let's watch his profile video Maurits van Ruijen is chief executive for academic affairs at Global University Systems He is also the president of the University of Europe for Applied Sciences, Germany. He studied economics history with a doctorate in geography at Utrecht University, where he also held his first academic position. He has published widely in green and sustainable urbanization and was visiting professor at universities across the world. before the launch of global university systems he was ceo and rector magnificus of nyen road university netherlands and prior to that executive vice president the university of westminster london acting vp at victoria university melbourne vp at leiden university in the netherlands he has also had positions at the erasmus university rotterdam and his alma mater utrecht university He has held leadership positions with international organizations such as including the World Association for Cooperative and Experiential Education and the Compostela Group of the University. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Maurits van Ruijen. Hi Professor Maurits, how are you? Hello. I'm doing very well and 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 you're a very wise man by calling me Professor Maurits. You know why poor people do that? Being Dutch, nobody knows how to use my family name. My family name, Van Rooyen, is actually Van Rooyen, and it's such a tongue twister for non-Dutch people that everybody just calls me <laughs> Professor Marvin. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And it's really an honor uh, having you on board, and uh, you are one of the academic celebrities that we uh, bring uh, to the world, and we have a good dialogue. Uh, because our topic is very important, and that is to have universities without walls. So it will be a great, uh, fun uh, interview. All right, starting an interesting conversation with a professor. Uh, my very first question is: uh, Besides the role of a CEO and president, how Professor Roijen holds a range of international leadership positions? including as the long serving co-chairman of US based World Association for Cooperative and Work Integrated Learning. Yeah, that's actually actually only a few of my positions. I got a few more, um, but I won't bore you with with all of them. And and the truth is um it keeps life exciting. Uh when you do only one job, uh it either gets boring or it swallows you up and it gets very stressful. And I've always found that doing different things in parallel keeps first of all life much more interesting, work much more interesting, but also in an interesting way takes away some of the stress. Because when you do one thing you're not doing something else. So you a problem which might be happening here which normally would kind of keep you sleep at night and so on you cannot afford that because you also have to look after other things. So it takes some stress away and I've done this my entire life. This is not something which I've been doing Uh, recently in my entire life I've always had different roles and different jobs at the same time so when I started off as an academic I also had a career in media 
I did a lot of work for, for television, radio, I wrote uh, popular books and so on, in addition to my university career. And I found that very kind of refreshing, one world to another. And it allows you to kind of deconnect from the day-to-day -day pressures. And, and even uh, when I was in university management positions, which, which you know, can be stressful in its own right, uh, for five years, for instance, I was uh, vice president at both University of uh, Westminster in London, and at the same time, I was vice president at Leiden University in the Netherlands. So I would just commute between the two countries and the two universities, very different type of universities. Leiden University, an ancient research-led university, Westminster, a large metropolitan central London uh, university. Very different institution, both in, in senior management positions, but Actually, in some ways, it took more stress away than added stress by, by having two major roles at the same time. So I've always done this. I like it. It's, uh, it makes you more efficient. You, you have less time to waste. You know, you can't go into meetings which last for three, four, five hours. You don't have time for that. You know, academics are very good at having meetings of four or five hours. And the truth is, you, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You need to stay focused and it makes you much more efficient and effective. I can recommend it to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we call you as an academic celebrity. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Mike question is that uh, you have been uh, contributing significantly towards the Bologna process. So my question is that how European universities uh, look at the Bologna process? Yeah, so the... the, the the, the question you, you ask me is, is really about what's happening in Europe. Yes. Yeah. And I grew up, I was born just next to the Belgian border on the Dutch side. Right. And I've always, purely by growing up in that area, been a little bit skeptical about what exactly a border is. The border is nothing. I could just walk across it. Uh, you know, there was nothing there other than on the map, there was a line. But otherwise, the people on the other side of the border are exactly the same as the people on this side of the border. Uh, you know, and as a child, I, you know, you didn't even go to border controls or something like that. You could just uh, freely move around. And, and you, you realize a border is something in your mind. It's not actually something real. It's not something tangible, right? And what is very important is that where the borderline suggests there is a big difference between this side of the border and the other side of the border. Actually, there isn't any, right? In reality, there's nothing. It's, it's, it's you know, the classic fairy tale of the emperor without clothes. That's what borders really are, right? It's, it's a construction which we have invented as human beings to kind of organize our physical space. That's really what it is. And so, when it comes to things like education and the higher objectives we have in education, but also when it comes to the, the realities of economy and social life, etc., actually borders play, play a less and less important role. It's not that something like that happened from one moment to another. It's not that someone decided they shouldn't be playing. The reality is they've been playing a less and less important role. There are people uh, like myself who move around the world. They work in different countries and different systems and so on more and more of us really we do not really see ourselves that much more as this is my patch and i need to defend it at, at, at all cost all the time and that's the reality globalization so what's happening in europe is is that kind of it's almost like a meta level that uh, the the different european countries started growing together but also the different universities when they were given that opportunity it was a natural thing for universities to embrace each other at European level and also at outside Europe. So what we have been doing in Europe is very much um, bringing universities together and, and emphasis is what actually really uh, unites us rather than what separates us. And of course, it's not just Europe, it's the world, but you have to start somewhere. And, and uh, therefore, I've been always a big supporter of, of what's, what's happening in Europe. Then the other aspect is like everything else in life, chance, purely chance. So when I was at Utrecht University, I'm academic in the 1980s, jobs of academics were not really that secure in the 1980s with all kind of government cuts and so on. And then 
the Erasmus University of Rotterdam offered me a job half time to internationalize the university. So this was in the early days. Uh, they didn't think that internationalizing a university was really a big job, so maybe a part-time job. So they asked me to take it half-time in addition to my Utrecht job. And, and that got a little bit out of control. So we, we really changed an, a quite local university, uh, Rotterdam, uh, you know, obviously a big port harbor. And the rector of those days, a young, very visionary man, uh, Alexander Rino Kahn, really felt you know, we as a university should be as international as our environment and our employers, etc. So I started working on that and, and that got a little bit out of control. As I said, it became uh, ultimately a full time job in, in, in different jobs at the university. The same which we had before. I didn't have one job in the, at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. I ended up having something like three. And um, yeah, and that basically became a, a launch platform for my the rest of my career. And that is understanding the importance of first internationalization and secondly globalization uh, and then ultimately the theme we have for today the university without walls of course it all comes from that thing but this was a bit of a, a coincidence as well that uh, this rector wanted to do that and at that stage in 1987 uh, also the uh, European Commission in, in Brussels uh, launched the so-called Erasmus programs, the mobility programs. So this was at the very start of that. So I was at the start of the uh, the, the Europeanization of higher education by luck, by chance, right? But also because I believed in it, and I, I it only reinforced my belief. You know, this is actually something really important for universities to think in international and in global terms and act in international global terms. And nowadays, of course, if you wouldn't do it, you're doing a disfavor to your graduates, right? So your, your, your graduates are going to have to work in a globalized world. So if you as an institution haven't been able to support them in that, you actually put them in the margin of the global village. So you don't really want to do that. You want to put them at the heart of the global village. So no university can afford not to be really international in outlook, in, in facilitating mobility, bringing in international uh, faculty, you know, working in, in collaborative online learning projects around the world. There's so much nowadays we can do much more than in 1987. But uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it has passed the stage from something which is great to have to, I cannot imagine education without it. Uh, how do you like navigate yourself as a president and how do you help in, in the future growth of the universities in Europe? So, University of Europe uh, in Germany is part of course of uh, a bigger family uh, called Global University Systems which is uh, something like now 28, 29 educational institutions around the world in Canada uh, in, in Europe, of course, in the UK, in, in India, Southeast Asia, uh, Caribbean, etc. Really, we're growing and growing and growing. And we grow at, at uh, the level of, uh, as a system, through acquisitions and so on. And we, last week, uh, for instance, uh, Future Learn in the UK, which is a, a subscribe, subscription model for higher education, became part of the group. Uh, we grow also at regional level so the group is now more and more organized in, in regions so like canada and americas uh, europe uh, uh, uk southeast asia etc and we grow at that level and then of course each institution grows through the student numbers right so growth is really what we do uh, very much based on on globalization thinking about you know higher education is not immune to globalization on the contrary it's a big opportunity for for education so we take full advantage of that uh, opportunity we um we grow now into purely kind of um in terms of, of size we are probably now in, in a private sector in the top five and we have achieved that in in, in roughly a decade in the world um, at institutional level, why we grow at the institutional level, I think a couple of things. First of all, we focus very much on where is the biggest demand, and that is professional education, right? 
So, uh, of course, there's also a need in society for research-led universities, highly selective universities. Nothing wrong with it. I'm a produce of it myself. But uh, the big need and the big opportunity, of course, is in professional education. So that's what we are focusing on. Secondly, we uh, very much focus on the fact that our graduates really because in the private sector they invest in their career so they do need to get jobs they need to be employable so we work very closely with you know employers to make sure that that is happening we listen to employers what they actually need from graduates so that's very very important and thirdly um, is our understanding of demand so in a classic model of, of education um, you got I, I exaggerate now a little bit but you got a group of professors coming together and they design the program because they think this is really exciting. Let's offer this program uh, to students and then make sure we select the right students to do that program. We do that a little bit different and we do this much more as the, the matching of demand and supply. So we carefully listen what is actually needed, where are the jobs, what do students really want to uh, study, what do they feel is, is a good investment in their studies, given their future careers and we then see can we actually offer those programs so do we have the supply side in order to be able to offer those programs but we do not start automatically on the supply side we definitely take very careful into consideration the demand side and by doing that it's a bit like um, when you try to sell something you can say okay this is a wonderful car buy it or you can actually listen to the clients and say okay how big is your family you know how fast do you want to drive how big is your budget how you know and 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 ask the question and then you say by the way here's the car for you this is the car you really want and guess what that's what people then buy right and uh and and that is i think one of the key reasons why we uh, grow so fast is that we take that matching of supply and demand the matching of what an individual wants with what we can offer wherever in the world uh, carefully together yeah it's a simple trick but but you will be surprised the big majority of universities don't work like that so professor human creativity and learning has led to the evolution into knowledge society so my question is that how professor morris see these knowledge societies in 2030 it's, it's a very, very uh, good question and it's not an easy question to answer in just a few seconds, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> right. So, I mean, obviously, when we look in the future, we extrapolate, you know, the current developments to the future and, and assume that the future will be a, a bigger version by, by looking at the lines and so on. So that's how we predict the future, right? So we cannot predict the unknowns after all. We can only predict the knowns, right? And uh, and then when I look at the, the, the mega trends in our current society, right? So uh, again, I'll simplify it. I will limit myself to just the three obvious mega trends. Now, two obvious and one maybe a bit of a surprise. The first one we already discussed, globalization. Right. It, it started a long time ago. It's not going to go away. It's not about whether it's good or bad. The truth is there is globalization. Higher education is supposed to have you know, a full positive impact on that globalization. It's not supposed to make a value judgment on it. It cannot stop it. It doesn't need to be defensive. It doesn't need to be reluctant following it. It needs to be full engaged for the sake of their own graduates and also for, for, for the institutional uh, development as, as, as we discussed a second ago. Globalization, obviously a trend, will not go away in 2030, will be even more prominent than it is uh, today. Uh, the second one we already mentioned briefly, uh, you know, digitalization, it's, it's uh, you know, clearly happening. Uh, it's, it's as powerful as the industrial revolution of the 19th century. In education, it is as powerful as the introduction of the printing press in, in the 16th century. It's there. We can manage the entire, you know, global system basically by using this <laughs> the device, right? So very, very powerful change, and of course, has a major impact on education as well. It doesn't mean that we replace all what we have, but it's a very powerful new educational tool we can use, and that, of course, is going to impact the entire. 
uh, society more and more. It has already impacted enormously. It's definitely not reached the, the end yet. Uh, and then linked to, to uh, artificial intelligence, and that is actually going to play a more and more prominent role in every aspect of life, including education, dare I say. Right. And then the third one I said is, is probably a little bit of surprise when I say that. I call it reintegration. So in the past, we solved problems by splitting it up in, in neat little bundles, right? So at every level. So at, at the academic level, we organized everything in schools with disciplines and, you know, everybody, every dean and every head of school and so on had their own role. And this is my patch. And, and we educate students in, in, in those areas, right? That's how we deal it with uh, education. Now we know, of course, that doesn't work anymore. The reality is that you cannot solve big problems unless you are actually able to think across disciplines because you do not solve a problem normally with one discipline. You have to nowadays really think beyond that. And education has to supply it. But it's at all aspects of, of life. The way we look at uh, a city, which is my academic area, right? So in the 19th century, or so in the 20th century in particular, uh, we really resolved the big urban problem by s splitting things up. So we, we had the so-called CM Charter, which says, okay, this is for pedestrians, this is for residential area, this is for working, this is for traffic, and we, we organize the space like that. And of course, you can't actually do that because that's a very inefficient system. So more and more urban planning realize we have to have a more fluid understanding as well. So you can't start reintegrating. So what we do academic is integrating the difference. Very wonderful, uh, Professor. Now, the next question is, every university has got their strategic plans that has got the vision and they will work accordingly to prove the mission statement and how does universities without walls will prepare for this right that's that's a very very good question uh, and to be honest when you read strategic plans of uh, many universities sometimes i say if you take away the name and you read it it can apply to almost any university right so <laughs> almost like they come from the computer and, and you just need to insert another name and now you've got an, an, another mission statement, another vision statement, another strategic plan. So this is, um, I think it, what, that, that's why I said it is really a good question. Um, probably you could say that Global University Systems is, is an example of a university without walls. Uh, because we are actually not really a university, we are a global system which composes of a little university, so some not that small, to be honest. And together we form what I call an, an, a forest rather than a tree. A university is a tree uh, and we have created something which is a forest, a lot of trees together, which are actually interconnected, working together as one ecosystem, very diverse. And as a consequence, you have a global university without walls, even though each university is still recognizable as, as a university. Right? And the, the mission and vision of that is, is actually a very simple one. And it's, it's actually the name. The name is Global University Systems. And it spells out what we really have set out to do. It's a vision, it's a roadmap what we wanted to do when we introduced that word uh, 10 years ago. And that is we wanted to build a university system, a university which is consisting of different universities, uh, very different types of institutions, all connected together, as already exists, of course, in, in, in a state, but then normally typically as state systems. And we wanted to take that at a global level. So actually create a complete global system for higher education a very ambitious plan uh, at that stage i was wondering whether it was maybe not too ambitious but nevertheless being an optimist i actually called it global university systems plural because i thought at a certain moment we got so big that the only way we can still manage it is by setting up uh, partial systems subsystems and and now 10 years later with with, with effectively close to 30 higher education institutions as part of that system that's exactly what we have started doing. We are now creating those subsystems, uh, which gives us kind of a pyramid of one system, big course, 
but with focus in, in different geographic areas so that we can manage it uh, more effectively because otherwise, of course, you know, you cannot really look after so many institutions at the same time. It's just not physically and mentally possible. And, uh, and as a consequence of that, we really now have uh, effectively higher education without walls. So maybe not a, a university without walls, but higher education without walls, uh, consisting of a lot of universities, which in itself all are very open institutions, open to collaboration with each other, very much uh, international minded, uh, and 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 very much also mission driven in the sense that uh, we do not have one mission for all our institutions. Each institution has its own focus. Some very much focused on particular academic specializations. Some very much focused on making. Uh, higher education accessible and affordable, others a bit more focused on, on the contrary, uh, making sure that they get, you know, a, a carefully selected group of students uh, with different fee levels as well, of course, uh, attached to that. And, and, and together, they all play their own part, like in any other ecosystem. Everything has its own role in that, but together, they are much more powerful than they would be as, as individual institutions. And that, for me, is the mission and vision. Uh, Professor, the world order is changing now. Uh, during COVID-19, we were waiting for the normal to come back. But after COVID-19, we realized that now this is the new normal. And still in today's world, uh, we are facing different challenges. Uh, like uh, we are facing the economic crisis. We have, the universities have underfunding issues. We have the social issues. We have uh, the challenge of digital transition. Uh, still, we have the major political issues. So, how do these universities without wall will face these issues to become the real yeah. universities without wall in 2030? The the the, the necessity uh, to adjust to. Uh, sometimes very radically changing circumstances is, is a, a big challenge for, for all organizations, whether it's a company or a university. By and large, universities are better at it than companies, interestingly. So companies, actually, there are very few companies which are able to weather a storm over a long period of time. Uh, the, the average lifespan of, of companies is, in the most optimistic scenario, average uh, a, a couple of years, right? And most actually don't. Actually, I've not seen the most recent statistics on that, but I can remember seeing the statistic where it was something like uh, around a year, right? So it's 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 true that it is an, an harsh environment you have to operate in, and and many do not survive. And and universities, by and large, have a much better track record, right? So uh, universities which are 50 years old are still considered young institutions, right? <laughs> it's it's. Uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting uh, to ask yourself the question, why do they survive so well? And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is um, universities are not really buildings or they are not really, in, in many ways, organizations. They're communities. And they're very interesting communities. They're communities of people who have a real emotional attachment to the place they, they work for and with. Right. So they, they don't necessarily see themselves as employees, they really see themselves as being part of the university. And even students, the best university, the students feel part of that community. Uh, even the companies which sometimes work with those uh, universities often feel an emotional attachment to it. So they, they are much more aware that this if something goes wrong, they have to step in and, and help to do something. Alumni, of course. Uh, you know, and especially in, in, in the States and so on, you see how much money they're willing to give to the alma mater to make sure that nothing goes wrong with something which is very precious to them. It's a very emotional relationship. And that gives uh, a university already a, a big head start compared with other parts, other organizations in, in society. But the other one is uh, management. You can still get it wrong. Uh, you can still go under as a university. And how do you uh, manage that risk? And a key tool to manage risks in higher education is, is diversification. So you, you, you can, of course, be in a relatively small, specialized institution, and so, but it also makes you more vulnerable. When something goes wrong, 
that actually might affect you more than when you are a diversified institution, which has different fields of study. It has, uh, you know, an, an, an also a different uh, um, target group for students. It's not just focused on one type of students. It, it might also have gone much more into the, the lifelong learning market. It, it might do much more work for short courses for companies and so on. Geographic diversification. I mean, I've, I've, together with some friends wrote a book. Uh, uh, it must have been 2008, 2009, or something like that, which I called the multinational university. A bit of a provocative title, but very much about universities thinking in in multinational terms, having a presence in different countries. Transnational education. I even predicted that transnational education might, at a certain moment, become more important than than purely the domestic education, which definitely. In, in the United Kingdom uh, has proven to be correct. So diversification uh, is something absolutely crucial as part of your risk management. And coming back to my own organization, Global University Systems, we are extremely diversified. I can hardly think of any more diversified approach to, to higher education, including modes of delivery, online delivery, campus-based delivery, etc. cetera. And, and, uh, and by doing that, Basically, whatever happens in the society, it is much easier for us to adjust to that because we have the expertise and we can shift around inside the system. Uh, whether it is a geographic change or whether it is an economic change or whether it's a social change, we can quickly react to that. And it, the, the, the key reason for that is diversification. I think in any institutional management of higher education, you always need to be very much aware Am I sufficiently diversified? How can I diversify further? Because you lower the risk. Of course, it makes it also, let's say, less profitable. I mean, most of the institutions are not particularly interested in profit anyway. Uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes better to just do one thing and you do it well, and then you make a lot of money out of that. But in risk management terms, it's much better to be diversified in higher education looking after in investing in, in your brand in your marketing and investing in your people M making sure that you understand that at the core of a successful educational institution with or without walls is always that emotional relationship you have with your university communities your professors your students your employees uh, your neighbors etc Professor, when we speak about globalization, internationalization, we speak about diversity because that is very much needed in order to achieve true international spirit. But there is also another challenge that lies uh, with this and that is inclusivity. Because racism, uh, uh, social disparity, uh, the right of every student to get the same facilities, same education, so, do you feel uh, and do you uh, uh, face this challenge in your German university? Of course, when you put uh, people with different backgrounds together, you get tensions. Uh, uh, whether that is because of cultural differences, religious differences, political differences, gender differences, etc., uh, you will get uh, tensions. Uh, one way of solving the tensions is making sure that everybody looks alike as much as possible. I think that's counterproductive, right? And and what you really want to do is is okay, you got diversity. Now, how do we manage those tensions? How do we make sure that people actually get cultural sensitivity, actually feel comfortable with people, uh, working with people, studying with people, uh, having fun with people, playing with people, etc. Who are different from yourself? When you understand that, actually, you have a massive advantage. There is an interesting piece of research where they asked uh, a monocultural group, so groups which looked as much as possible together, let's say all male or all female, all with a similar kind of background and so on, to compete to very diverse groups of different uh, backgrounds and, and even also different academic backgrounds, uh, engineering and, and arts, etc. Right? Sometimes the groups outperform the, the, multi the multicultural. That in itself is not a particularly shocking result, but the question is why did some groups outperform? And it was all about leadership. If you lead an, a diverse group by respecting diversity and actually seeing diversity as a positive thing and actually drawing out of that diversity, you easily outperform a monocultural group.
If on the other hand, you're a leader who is trying to impose your culture on a, on a diverse group, you will fail. Uh, so having multicultural uh, classrooms, etc. Yes, it, it, it triggers an extra dimension because yes, you will automatically get some tensions now and then and, and there will be prejudices and so on. The main thing is that people are actually becoming aware of them, confront them, but also start understanding why it is actually good when people are different from you and that you actually start thinking not just about everybody should be like me, but you actually say it's a big advantage actually have something to contribute which I might not see much. To be honest, the, the, the color of the skin or, or gender, etc. aren't really the main uh, differentials when, when it comes to the differentiators. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to performance, you just want to have the best people, very diverse groups, think in terms of teams. So it is a big advantage in studying in a, in a, in a, in a diverse group. And, and I'm, I'm passionate about uh, you know, embracing diversity rather than seeing it as a threat. Very often, whether it's at the university or in society, diversity is seen as a threat and actually they do not realize that diversity can be a major strength as long as you manage it in the right way, as long as you lead it in the right way. Right? The problem isn't the diversity, the problem is how do you actually lead diversity, how do you deal with it? And precisely uh, given the answer and uh, because it's a tricky question and this is a real challenge for all the universities, but you are very rightly summarize on. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor, as, as the future universities will be ubiquitous and transnational, uh, will there be a question of institutional sustainability? How, how universities will, future yeah, universities sure. will sustain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the, 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 the kind of two, two types of sustainability, we use the same word for it and, and that can be confusing. So one time we talk about sustainability in an ecological sense, in a green sense. And of course, yeah. as that happens, I'm, I'm passionate about that. It's my academic field, right? Sustainable urbanization, how to create living conditions which actually are uh, sustainable in, in every sense, certainly also ecological, but also in, in social and economic sense and so on. And the other one is more the institutional sustainability. How can I make sure that my institution survives over a long time? And, and we already touched a bit on that when we talked about, you know, the big risks uh, we have to face in, in modern society. And uh, it's sometimes I prefer the word um, stewardship to sustainability, right? Uh, stewardship actually puts it okay, what do I need to do in order to be a good steward? Um, stewardship is something I, I is, a, is a word I feel quite passionate about. It is about seeing, feeling a sense of responsibility for, first of all, next generations, right? That you actually, as a person, are not just responsible for now, but also for, you know, what your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on will get. So that's the stewardship. You have to look after things with care so you can hand it over with proud to the next generation. Uh, it's the, the opposite of greed, trying to get as much as possible yourself as fast as possible and not leave anything for anybody else. So stewardship in that sense, but also stewardship in the sense of you also have a sense of responsibility for, for others for other people. So not just for the future, but also for the people who are now with you. Uh, and that if you are successful, you actually also have to, to share that success. You need to have a positive impact on other people. You need to look after not just your family, but basically you, you make sure that it is not an ego trip. Life is not an ego trip. Uh, you need to understand the context of life. And that is your, your, your value your moral compass, your value of really trying to do as well as possible in your life in, 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 and be a good steward of whatever you do in, in, at every level in, in, in your action. Now, that kind of value, I think, should play a more prominent part in education. It is not about politics. It's not about religion. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It is very much about making students alive aware that life is also about more than just me, right? And that you can only be successful by actually 
being aware of other people, respecting other people as individuals and seeing as allies, as team members, etc. That kind of thinking, that social thinking is, I think, something. If you want to be critical of education in the past, um, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, in Western society, there was this kind of greed is good movement, right? And, and success was really about a rat race. Life is a rat race, right? And universities started producing more and more rats. And actually for most parts of society, that is a disaster. You know, if education does that, it's a disaster. So you need to have people who actually understand what they're doing is in the context of stewardship, in the sense of responsibility. When you want to be a leader, when you want to be a manager, when you want to be an entrepreneur, that comes with responsibilities, it comes with obligations. And I think that is a, a crucial element of education, proper education, bringing in those values, in, 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 in converting those values into uh, our educational uh, programs. Not because we say just repeat them all the time, but actually challenge students to think like that and actually see that a purely uh, ecocentric, power-driven uh, approach, in the end of the day, will hurt everybody, often including themselves. And and uh, and so that is why I think what your question is is really spot on. It is about uh, sustainability of the institution, but but it's also about what exactly are the values that underpin that institution. What is what are the values that underpin uh, education in general? Uh, professor, uh, the European universities are now focusing towards collaboration and globalization and internationalization. While uh, on the other hand, the universities across Europe are uh, focused towards having more resources. So, my question is that uh, when we speak about academic freedom. We talk about institutional autonomy, we talk about funding challenges, we talk about collaboration. So how will universities without walls prioritize amongst these factors? Would it be uh, autonomy, would it be funding, would it be collaborations or globalization or would it be resources? So, first of all, um, at the core of, of institutional autonomy and uh, at the core of, of the academic as soon as you, as an institution, are heavily dependent, you, you cannot really be that independent anymore in what you do and, 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 and why you're doing it, right? So, one uh, kind of powerful element of, of the, the globalization of higher education is actually it can reinforce the independence of institutions because they actually are operating across borders, etc. Et I'm a passionate advocate of making sure that we do we what we preach and that is it, we want our students to be critical thinkers we want students to be confident in their ability to think outside the box follow sometimes and you know an, a little bit more unconventional way of, of doing business or you know whatever they want to do in their life have the confidence to do that assess the risks which are associated with certain decisions, the critical thing, the ability to do critical analytics. We then also make sure that the professors are able to do that and the institutions are able to do that. The value of education cannot be indoctrination, right? If institutions basically just repeat whatever they are told to do in their education, actually you devalue the education and as a consequence of that, you also take away value of your graduates and their future role in society. No society in the long run can survive without people being able to think outside the box and sometimes take, do something a bit less conventional or being critical or voicing their opinions and so on, because that becomes then the collapse of society. It is very risky when national political agenda starts basically dominating and dictating uh, what happens at university. And, and there is sometimes unconsciously a, a desire from politicians who are elected to say, well, this is what I stand for. Universities are not actually saying or teaching what I feel they should be teaching. 
and then have the, 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 the temptation to want to uh, interfere in that. That is actually very dangerous. I'm at the moment in, in, uh, in Germany. In Germany, after the, the very negative experience of the 1930s, 1940s, they wrote in the constitution that government politicians are not allowed to interfere in education. Freedom, academic freedom, is written in the Constitution. And I think that's a very healthy thing to do. It is very, very dangerous when we do not have a very clear separation between what happens in education and what happens, you know, in, in politics. Uh, there are different things. Uh, and, um, and anything which can help universities to safeguard that, you know, including globalization, I think is, is a positive thing including uh, financial independence and so on. It's a positive thing. Having said that, there of course is also the other side, and that is academic freedom comes with responsibilities, right? It doesn't mean that the professor can say whatever he wants to say with, with immunity and nobody can question it. Right? So there are, uh, when it comes to economic, uh, academic freedom, also obligations on, on, the, on the teacher's part. And that is, what do you actually do with it? Uh, and, and the crucial part there for me is that you are modest in your role of a professor. You're not there to tell students what is the right answer. You're not there to tell students that this is what you need to think. You're only there to help to facilitate the development of this critical thinking, the development of this, this independent mindset. And uh, as soon as professors start crossing that line and actually start saying to students, this is the right answer, this is what I want you to, to say because this is what I want you to, you know, to believe in, uh, then uh, the professor is at fault because they, they're actually abusing their academic freedom. So there's a, an interesting and very complicated balancing act. One hand, the respect you need to have from the state, from the governments, from, from politicians and saying, we trust universities and we will not interfere. On the other hand, the, the need of, of those to, who have that freedom to use it in a, in, a, in, a, in a responsible way and supporting, coaching students to make up their own mind. Okay. So now, now it's time to hear from Professor Morris what the world don't know about Professor Morris. So the very first question, who were you close to, your father or your mother? Um, I mean, obviously as a child, I was close to both my father and my mother, but uh, have to choose that was probably closer to my father yeah i i uh, i think i understood my father uh, in a different area where you wouldn't say all the time because you be laughed at and so on i think that was uh, genuine uh, yeah so uh, definitely both of course but uh, um, probably closer to my father than them to my mother in the end yeah so this means uh, that your mentor is your father whatever you are today is under the mentorship of your father right yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of what I do, uh, I kind of uh, still see my and feel my father uh, whisper. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, Professor, what is your favorite sports? So, I admit I'm not really an, an, a sports person. <laughs> so, I. Uh, uh, the, 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 the thing I do myself, which is not really a sport, uh, but, but uh, in order to relax and uh, uh, to kind of step out of my work now and then is, is, is I walk, I hike, I go into nature and I uh, disconnect that way. Uh, and um, now that is not a sport, it's a leisure, I appreciate that. Um, but this is, this is what I do in order to, uh, to make a bit of a separation between you know, the day-to-day -day pressures and, you know, the, the physical exercise and so on. But sports as such, no, I do not watch sports. Uh, I've started a couple of sports like golf and so on as, as, as an alternative, but my work and my lifestyle and a lot of travel and so on really oh. are not really helpful when it comes to, uh, to, to either practicing sports or even watching and following sports. Yeah. But what you do is really amazing that you hike and you go for walk. You cut off the word that you use to cut off from the routine and you get back with the, with the so much of the energy. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I, whenever, 
I, so every time I got a moment, I escape. Right. So even uh, I had a short break before this interview. I quickly you know, we lived next to a little forest and had a, a nice walk in the cold there in the, in the in the in the snow and uh, just to get uh, fresh air. And uh, it's something I do almost like in in uh, Egypt. So kind of keep keep myself physically uh, active. Yeah. That's true. Okay, you go Okay. Uh, if you if you got a time machine, professor, where would you travel to the future or to the past? Um, I'm very curious about the future, but I probably would still go back to the past. Uh, and um, probably the rationalization of that is that in the past I can influence the present. And uh, no, definitely a couple of things I wouldn't mind <laughs> influencing a little bit in the present. So uh, I probably would go back in the past. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor, you have so many things on your plate. So how many hours of sleep you take? Ah, my favorite topic. I love sleeping. I absolutely <laughs> love sleeping. It, it's. Uh, it's one of the most precious things in, in, in life, I think, sleeping. Uh, no, I do sleep uh, eight, nine hours a, a day if I can. Of course, okay. sometimes uh, yeah, I might not okay, exactly make that, but I aim That's for that. Good. And by the way, uh, interesting uh, little fact, uh, I think it was a Harvard research which showed that there was a direct correlation between how effective CEOs were and how many hours they slept. The less they sleep, the less effective their judgment is as CEO and, and the less effective they are as lead. So it's crucial for everybody with, with leadership aspirations one take sleep seriously and, and enjoy it. Yeah. A very perfect tip for us. Yes, as well. And uh, it means that uh, scientifically and medically we need to have eight to nine hours of sleep to be more productive. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Professor, which superhero uh, would you want to be and why? Right. Um, I think probably it's, it's not a very well-known superhero, uh, to be honest. Uh, it, it's the Man of Steel. Uh, don't think he's worldwide famous. Uh, it's a robot <laughs> from my childhood, of course. But, uh, <laughs> But he he we do things which which uh, unfortunately as human beings we are not able to do because our body is too weak. And, uh, yeah, it would be great to have that kind of constitution which wasn't so much dependent on how is our body feeling today. Uh, you know, <laughs> am I getting tired, losing concentration, etc. So that probably would be my uh, my superhero, Man of Steel. Yeah. Archie he was called, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, which three famous people? would you like to invite at a dinner? Um, I would not invite politicians, in all fairness. There's nothing wrong with politicians, but, uh, uh, you know, at a dinner party and politics, maybe not. Uh, so I, I would want, and an obviously, yes, I um, have an academic background, and of course you would love to have someone like uh, uh, you know Einstein, or, or uh, you know one of the the, wow. the the big scientists, and 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 have a conversation with him about you know really what he saw uh, it, and others didn't see, and how did it come that he saw that? Uh, so, so definitely that would be one of my my guests for sure. Um, but otherwise, I would be more interested in in the the arts, and and I think. Very often, creative people are, are more interesting at a dinner party than than uh, <laughs> than even scientists. Though I'll, I'll happily make an exception for Einstein. Um, so maybe a writer and a painter, uh, of course. And then I'm on the painter side. Um, well, there's so many many to choose from, but maybe I'll go for for be a bit biased. Uh, Van Gogh. Uh, he was born not too far away from where I was born, and. Of course, he, he was probably one of the most unconventional painters. Uh, difficult person, I'm not sure he would be fun at the dinner party, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by someone like him who was willing to go beyond all the convention and really uh, you know, do what he felt passionate about. And, and, and at, at the, ultimately, of course, his, his, his mental well-being as, as a prize. But uh, that would be, that's a, 
for me a fascinating figure. Though. Um, others would probably be pretty high on my list. And then uh, on writers, which I must admit, I've, I've never really written fiction books myself, only non-fiction. I, I love writing, uh, but uh, I admire people who are able to, to write in fiction. And the person who probably has been the most impressive as a writer, not because his books are the most impressive, but just purely by the fact that he was able to write three, four, five, six books a year which is absolutely amazing when you think about it, just writing six books a year or something like that, is, is, is a Belgian writer called Simonon. And, uh, and Georges Simonon, uh, actually people know him because of the Inspector Magret books, but he wrote those books just for the fun of it, uh, as an entertainment. And uh, he wrote also other books, which are often very psychological, he called them, uh, you know, his heart books. Uh, and uh, a man with amazing insight in human beings, especially those who are struggling uh, mentally, etc. But uh, but at the same time, also just <laughs> beyond imagination that you can actually find the time and the energy to write so many books here. Bring year out, uh, just as I said, uh, uh, you know, a low productivity year for activity year would be like eight books a year or something like that. It's just amazing when you think about it. Really very interesting personalities to bring together. Uh, you know, a, a down to earth writer like that, a successful, a, a painter who just <laughs> refused to stick to the convention, and, 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 and a scientist who changed our world and, uh, and then see what happens. So this answer relates to the previous question about the time machine. So you definitely need a time machine to bring all these people to. Absolutely, yeah, it would be great. Uh, bring them in. <laughs> then the, the question is, of course, what do we cook for them, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, what are the three words that describe Professor Nora? Um First of all, of course, I'm an educator. I, I, I do not make a secret of that. I, um, even in my management style and so on, I, I don't tell people what to do. I'm an educator. I ask questions, I guide them, I coach them. I, I really uh, think like an educator. And that's really what I do at all levels, all the time. Uh, so yeah, that's in my, my, my blood, uh, being an educator. The, the, the other thing is, uh, I'm obviously a global citizen. I, I've lived in many countries, I believe in globalization, I love the diversity of cultures and so on. So the, the, being a global citizen is, is definitely an, a defining feature of me as well. And then the, the other one is, well, I I'm doubting it's probably related to, yes, I'm, I'm entrepreneurial, but actually probably the better way of describing it is I, I believe in impact. What I do needs to have an impact. I'm not someone there who just drifts aside away and, and only thinks in theory and so on. I always want to translate concepts, theories and so on. Okay, and what does it mean? What can I do with this? What is really the impact? And, and of course, what I mean with that is a positive impact. I, I'm, I'm passionate about trying to have a positive impact on, on the life of individuals. Uh, as well as on 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 society as as a well. whole. Okay, Professor, what is the thing that scares you the most? Favorite book? Well, you might think I, I'll quickly quickly pick one from Simon Orr, but not not really. I think the book which is uh, one of the most impressive ones. Uh, well, there are many. There are many. <laughs> Where do we start? Uh, but I'll, I'll pick one from my own uh, language. That's probably a fair uh, one uh, to do, uh, and that is uh, a book which has had. At early age, uh, an, a quite a, a big impact on my life, and that was uh, uh, Milti Tuli. And Milti Tuli is in, set in the 19th century, uh, and it's about a, a Dutch uh, person who is, is sent to Indonesia to, to on behalf of the government to help to organize the, the, the coffee uh, trade, etc. And, the, and, the coffee. and of course, then observes that this is an old book, right? So this is 19th century. Uh, the, 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 the the fundamental uh, things which were wrong in 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 in, in those days in, in the entire colonial attitude and so on and actually having the guts to write that book in in, in at the same time write it in such a way that it, it's a, it's a literature uh, marvel piece so it has a, a very powerful message very 
opportunity to you know, to decide. And at the same time, uh, wrote it as, as a literature masterpiece with so many different layers and so on. You can read it and reread it and reread it. It's a beautiful language, uh, very, very much advanced over time as well. So that probably would be my my number one choice because I think it's uh, it's a book you read for the pleasure of the beauty of it as well as uh, how impressive the, the message is. Yeah. And yeah, I'm not sure it's translated that? in English, but I suspect yeah. it must have been. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll have to look that up. <laughs> yeah. uh, Professor, what is one thing that scares you the most? Uh, there are many things which scare me. I'm, I'm not particularly a courageous person. There are a couple of things which I, I do happily. I don't mind speaking to, to large audience, etc. But <laughs> when it comes to the, the nitty gritty, uh, I wouldn't call myself a courageous person. I, I, uh, I'm not good with big heights. I'm not good with big crowds and I'm not good with small spaces and all this kind of stuff I, I definitely you know I'm not the classic macho uh, who will uh, take any challenge <laughs> any time okay professor the childish thing you still enjoy but I must probably say you, you still do <laughs> yeah 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 yes 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 I uh, okay I admit it I'm, I'm uh, a, a licorice addict um, probably has to do with the fact that I'm Dutch and uh, I just discovered a shop around the corner here, a Swedish shop, which has 100 different types of licorice. Licorice, uh, for those of you who are less familiar with it, is a real acquired taste. If you haven't had it uh, as a child, you probably think it's, it's one of the most disgusting things you ever get in your, <laughs> <laughs> as a sweet. It, it's not sweet at all, uh, okay. but it's, it's once you have it, uh, you get addicted. To it, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm still addicted to it. I, I love my licorice. Yeah. So you still have it? Oh yes, oh yes. I'm, 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 I, I just moved the camera. Otherwise, if I would still have been in the living room, I probably would see you would see me occasionally. Uh, think, ah, I, I know, sure. I cannot be here. We are. <laughs> cannot be without one. There, there we are. They're nice black, not sweet at all uh, okay. pieces of, of licorice. I will not put one in my mouth now because I cannot answer your question. I'll do that as soon as the interview is over. So you have made us curious and we'll try it too. <laughs> okay. So what is your favorite childhood memory? What is the one thing that you still remember and miss that thing? I, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I have a lot of uh, childhood memories and, and, and because we moved when I was four years old, I also know what is predates my fourth anniversary of the birthday and, and what is after. So the earliest uh, childhood memories which, which I really enjoy um, and still enjoy today. When the snow arrives, you go outside and then, yes, it's cold, but it's, it's still magic. For me, snow is, is I still enjoy it. At the, at the moment, it's a winter's day, it has been snowing, and it makes me happy like a child again. Right. Wow, that's great. Okay, Professor, your favorite color to wear? Well, in, in my job, you wear either dark gray or dark blue. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I would be lying if I said dark grey and dark blue are my favourite colours. Um, it's 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 probably uh, green, green. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I love green. I uh, I love the green of nature. I like uh, walking in nature. Uh, uh, my car is green. Uh, you know, so yeah, green is my favourite colour. But I do not wear it on the on the daily basis. <laughs> I'm afraid that's still, you know, the the the. The man's privilege of, uh, okay, shall I wear a grey shirt today or shall I wear a blue shirt today? By the way, these colors are the colors of professional blue, grey. Uh, these colors make the man perfect. <laughs> it's the it's life of a man, is easy, right? It's, uh, this is, uh, you know, can you imagine the, the beauty of, of, you know, when you're a woman, uh, you have to come up all the time with the right outfit and the right color and so for men it doesn't really <laughs> <laughs> that's the question that's, that's really hectic for us yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay uh, professor what would you change about yourself one thing that you would like to change about mm, 
I mean, I'm, 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 to be honest, I'm a, I'm a quite comfortable person. I, I, there's not a young list of things I, I want to do different, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this is something I actually need to think about for a moment. But but when I probably maybe, uh, and this is also what my assistant uh, tells me, I, I should more readily say no when I'm asked something, right? <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, when people ask me and I say, yeah, that's great, makes sense, let's try to find a way of doing it. And then uh, uh, as a consequence, I give her a big headache because I don't have the time to do it. Uh, <laughs> this is so, so she said, why don't you just say no, right? And and that's probably true. I'm, I'm inclined to to do more and more and more. And then at a certain moment, uh, yeah, you have to start coming to that stage where you say, sorry, cannot be done. And, and maybe I should say that a bit more quickly. And, and so... That's probably a character change I, I should consider and, and being a little bit more assertive and just uh, be a bit more drawing the line and saying no, no, no. But then again, if I would have said no, we would not have this conversation together, right? And it's fun. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. 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 And this is because you, uh, by nature, you give respect to people, you try to give benefit to the people, you try to help people, and this is the reason that makes you, uh, that make it difficult for you to say no to people and you try to help them. So this is the positive side of you. And I, I really think <laughs> yeah, there, there are different reasons why I don't say no. One is uh, the, the the fact that you don't want to disappoint people, and, and you know, if I can help them or can do something, why not? Uh, and the other one is, is, to be honest, I also enjoy it. I enjoy this interview, I enjoy the, the interaction with people. So there is a, 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 a personal something in it for me as well, and that I, I, I do enjoy what I do, and I would you know, like to do as much as possible. Uh, Professor, uh, what message would you like to give to students and faculty of Vilma University? What I hope education does to students is, is to give them confidence. So the most important uh, things I want to say, a couple of things I want to say to students is, is number one is, is don't be afraid to fail. Uh, you know, that can be critical in, in education where we actually, you know, even write on the, on the paper, right, F, fail. Right? And, and, and it irritates me when that happens. What you really want to do is, is uh, to build up students' confidence and try to find out what they're good at. And, and don't get so fixated on what they're not good at. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is good in every subject area and everything they do in life. Right? We all have our faults. I'm not perfect either. Right? And, and maybe the man of steel is uh, perfect, but, but then again, he's not human. Right? It's a definition of being human. You're not perfect. And, and in education, we kind of uh, mark down everything you are not really top achiever in. Um, so the main thing as a student is to ignore that and actually accept that it's important to find out what you're good at, what you like, what you're passionate about, and do not be afraid to fail because that actually is only a tool to find out you know, where you maybe are not that good. And then you have to think in, in terms of teams. And that, that is the, the, the other thing thing which is so important I, I want to give to our students. Don't only look at yourself, but always see yourself in the context of a wider group. Uh, you do not need to be perfect because actually you work with other people who can compensate your failures. And uh, my philosophy in life has always been, I don't need to be perfect because I work with other people who have the ability to do things I'm, I'm not that good at. And ideally they are a hundred times better than I am. And that's great, right? So I want to work with the best I can find. And then together, that's the role you need to discover. It's not just about you and discovering your own strengths and weaknesses. And actually, don't worry too much about the weaknesses. Don't use the criticism on others' weaknesses just to, in order to feel better yourself. But actually, focus on their strengths and see how you can uh, uh, work together and, and achieve something uh, great. And that means you also need to look at other people as individuals. Your professor is not just a professor, it's other person. There's a person who serves a meal in a canteen, it's actually a person. And, and, right? and the receptionist can be a very interesting person. So what you want to, to develop in students isn't just the knowledge and so on, it's the social intelligence, which is you know, what we call social intelligence. Outstanding different people, where they're coming from, etc. Social intelligence. 
if we can give that to students, or if students become aware of that, that's actually going to be a major factor in their success in their life. Not the fact that they do not make a mistake in, a, in, a, in calculus or, or do not make a grammar mistake, etc. That's not going to determine whether they are going to be successful in life, right? Mm. So, yes, don't be afraid, be confident, dare to do things uh, which nobody else has done before, dare to make a mistake, uh, of course, think about the mistake, why did it go wrong, what I learned from it, but don't be afraid of doing that. Work with other people, don't treat life as, as an ego trip, don't be too self-centered, and, uh, and, and really recognize other people for what they are. Develop that social skill of interacting with other people, because that will help you in the rest of your life. And build up your networks, including social media networks and do that as well that's great but don't get fooled it's just social media networks understand what you need to do with networks and that is um it's not about you get out of it but it's actually be generous right and that's maybe the, the last thing which students uh, do not always understand they, they become like transactional i give you something you give me something right or i take something from you and i don't give something in return even better well that is stupid right that is downright stupid that is a fail uh, you need to understand that the way things work in life is is about networking it's about being generous you connect people you give people time and your reward will come for that sometimes not directly sometimes maybe not even indirectly but that's part of the game but that's how you need to play the game in life and that's really what you want to to give to students uh, it's not just about passing exams, it's about you developing as a person. That's really the, the, the key thing of education. Very impressed. You have uh, given a very strong message to all the students, all of us. And these, uh, if uh, a person follows these principles, I'm sure he or she is going to accept this at any cost. Right. Uh, so, Professor, uh, what 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 is your feedback about the show like bringing academic celebrities like we have brought you as an as an highlighted academic celebrity so what is your feedback so I, i've given guest lectures uh, i've given speeches all over the world and so on and and people have asked me what is my definition of a good speech so you know when when do you feel you, you know your speech was was right and my answer is always um, when I walk away and I have learned something. Maybe the audience have learned something as well. That's, I cannot know, I can only hope. But when I walk away and I have suddenly um, the feeling of, hmm, someone asked a question and I didn't actually know the answer on that question, that's very interesting, right? This is actually helps me, you know, I learned something. Right, because I didn't know the answer to that question or there was a question I wasn't really thinking about and, and it was asked to me and it actually, you know, is a little bit like a mirror. It's uh, So I, I enjoy this very much. Your, your questions are... And uh, I uh, so I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, having this opportunity. It's, it's not the kind of classic you know, this is the question and, and I know the answer and, and we just record it and the audience will know you. You have been sometimes quite challenging in your questions and I, I like that uh, because it, it, it forces me to think. And of course, you know, the, 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 the personal questions, you know, that, that's, that's also uh, quite healthy sometimes, right? Sometimes we get so obsessed by our work that we forget that uh, we're also just human beings, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank so you. I enjoyed it very much. So thank you very much me here and, uh, and uh, having this effectively more dialogue than, than, than interview. Yeah. Uh, we would also like to uh, thank you and acknowledge uh, your kindness here uh, on behalf of Ilma University and our board of governors and our chancellor, Mr. Nwan Lakhani, that you took your time out for us and you very dedicatedly and passionately uh, heard us and listened to us and you uh, not only uh, guided us about the real meaning of life, but you also advised and guided us about how to have true spirit of globalization and how universities should focus uh, towards uh, 2030. 
so uh, we are very thankful to you and we really enjoyed and we really learned from your experience and uh, thank you so much and it thank was you. a pleasure and honor having you on board thank you so much thank you professor it was it was really nice to have you and and uh, it's for the audience we would like to thank you for bearing with us and we'll see you with with our another like interesting personality uh, in, in, in the near future so see you and take care take care professor and thank you and honor once again for your time take care everyone that is